friends, welcome to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise and I didn't lose my egg tooth until I was like nine years old. This is a baby snake and so is this and so is this. Now these are all babies and these are all snakes, but they all came into the world in very different ways. Today we are going to talk about why some snakes lay eggs, some snakes give live birth, and why some do something sort of in between. Let's go. If you ask most people what one of the defining characteristics of a reptile is, I'm willing to bet that they lay eggs will probably be on that list. And it is true for most reptiles, but not all. There are species of skink that give birth to live young, and there's even one that lays eggs and does live birth too, but that's a whole other thing and that is going to get its own video. Jackson's chameleons do live birth and many species of snakes give live birth to little squiggly babies. But why is that? Laying eggs must clearly have a huge advantage for so many reptile species to use it. So why would just a few buck the trend? The current most common definition or description of how snakes, or any reptile really, come into the world is that there are three ways they can go. Oviparous, ovi meaning egg, and paris meaning to bring forth or reproduce. Then there's viviparous, viva meaning to live, and paris meaning the exact thing I said four seconds ago. Okay, okay, yes. Of course. It can also be pronounced viviparous and, you know, tomato, tomato, potato, potato, either, either is fine. You know, things sometimes are pronounced differently than as you immediately hear. It's okay. It's just a word. Happy learning. Lastly, there's ovoviviparous, which if you've been following along with the Latin bits, you can probably guess is both egg bearing and live bearing. I know, I'll get to how that works in a little bit, along with why snakes and other reptiles can't just settle on one approach and call it a day. I'm also going to explain why this current commonly held understanding is not quite right and how we might want to think about redefining these different strategies for reproduction and why there are so much conflicting information from credible sources about which species uses which strategy. So before you jump into the comments a little later in the video saying, you said garter snakes do this, but they actually do that, or bows are actually this, just wait until the end for some extra context. Thank you. Okay, let's start our journey with the humble egg. Nutritious and sometimes delicious little orbs of goodness packed with all the lipids, proteins, and other essential nutrients a growing reptile needs. They have a hard or leathery shell that offers protection and allows for the exchange of gases and moisture. They do the job, but are they better than, say, our approach of gestating our young internally? What are the advantages of laying eggs? Is laying eggs just an evolutionary holdover that reptiles just haven't gotten around to evolving away from and one day they'll be as good as us highly evolved mammals? Heck no! That's a pretty anthropocentric way of looking at things, eh? What is wrong with you people?! Laying eggs as a reptile is a really solid strategy all around, and here's why. It's less stressful for the mother. Carrying offspring to full development can come with a great physical toll, while egg production and partition are not as stressful to the mother and her body. Because egg production inside a reptile takes less time than producing a full-sized offspring, the body has more resources and more time available to create more babies and even more clutches per year. Not Every egg laying species does this, but it is an advantage to many. Additional clutches also help with genetic diversity. Fertilization of eggs for laying allows for multiple matings from different males, meaning there's a higher chance to produce greater diversity of young. And then there's survival of the offspring. In the event that the mother dies, eggs can survive without her as long as they've already been laid, obviously. Not so much with live bearing animals. In most of those cases, if the mom dies, the baby does too. Because the babies are inside of her, living from her, like a tiny parasite. Pretty solid arguments, but laying eggs is not without some potentially significant disadvantages too. For example, nests, particularly unguarded nests, which is pretty common for most reptiles that aren't birds, 
are vulnerable to passing predators looking for a nutritious snack. And even if the nest is undisturbed, hatchlings are often small and with little defenses, making their survival rate lower. One of the reasons why reptiles lay eggs in large numbers a lot of the time. Another big one is the fact that successful hatching of the eggs depends on the mother's ability to find a spot with the perfect environmental conditions for incubation. This is not always easy or even possible, especially in an ever-changing climate. As species evolve and adapt to the niche they occupy, the relative impact of these advantages and disadvantages will vary. And if the disadvantages outweigh the advantages enough, but not so much or so fast that the species goes extinct, then the lengthy and biologically expensive process of evolving to live bearing might occur. We'll talk about those snakes that made that switch in a minute, but first, let's look at what goes on with oviparous or egg-laying snakes. So here's an example of a species that uses the ovipary method. This is Callie, my Macklet's python, and this is one of her adorable babies that hatched on Father's Day, actually. Funnily enough. After growing her eggs inside of her, Callie dug a little hole under her hide and laid her eggs. She, like many python species, curled up around them to guard them and provide a little warmth through shivering. Now, not all snakes do that extra bit. Generally, once they lay the eggs, that's that. Callie didn't really fuss and easily moved off the eggs when I came to collect them and sat by, seemingly completely unconcerned as I transferred them into an incubator. And a couple of months later, a bunch of wiggly babies that she still kind of wants nothing to do with popped out and they were ready to go. This is the way that most oviparous snakes do. Like I mentioned, some species will protect the eggs and provide a tiny bit of care. Cobras actually build nests that they guard fiercely, but generally speaking, egg laying snakes take a kind of set it and forget it approach. Let's look at what goes on inside. Cole's notes version here. There's a bunch of neat stuff about how the shell forms and how the baby pulls the minerals for their development from it. Uh, how the goop inside of the egg will nourish the young comes about, like how the goopy goop is even made. Uh, and even how the babies develop inside. And it's all fascinating stuff to some people. <laughs> I'm going to keep it brief and only talk about how the egg comes to be. I want to keep the video under the 15, 20 minute mark and have all y'all stick around and not get bored by all the sciencey stuff. Did, did you just say all y'all? Yeah, I lived in Virginia for like a quarter of my life. I think I'm allowed to say all y'all. Uh, no. Yes. All right. A snake's ovaries contain small, immature egg cells called oocytes. Before ovulation, the oocyte and its surrounding follicle cells start to grow and mature. This is a process called oogenesis. Yes, I know that does not sound like it's a real thing. That is actually what it's called. This continues until the oocyte is fully mature and the follicle has become a fluid-filled sac called a vesicle. Hormones are then released, which triggers ovulation, and the mature oocyte is released from the ovary and travels through the oviduct where it can be fertilized by sperm. Here's your sperm. Once ovulation occurs, the oocyte and the vesicle form an egg. The fertilized egg will develop within the female's body and when ready, are laid as fully formed but unhatched eggs. If the conditions are right, the babies develop and grow from the nutrients within the egg and eventually hatch when all the cooking is done. <laughs> Easy peasy. Now let's switch over to those snakes that don't lay eggs, whose babies come out all squiggly and full of sass. The first thing we should look at is why? Why would some snakes eschew all the advantages I mentioned earlier of laying eggs? Well, it's probably one of, or a combination of these reasons. The biggest, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is likely the environment they lived in did not provide consistent enough conditions that are favorable to incubating eggs. Too hot, too cold, big swings in temperature, flooding, drought, in the ocean, looking at you sea snakes. Once the eggs are laid, they are there until they hatch, or don't. If the environment is not stable enough, it is far better to keep your babies inside while you, imagine you're a snake here, move to suitable conditions to incubate the babies within you. Too cold? Find a rock warming in the sun. Too hot? Move to the shade. 
you get it. Another big one is that the babies can be better protected. This is especially effective where the risk of predation of the mother is significantly lower than of a clutch of eggs. Staying inside of mom means that when she flees a potential predator, the babies go with her. They are also protected from fungus, bacteria, mold, even parasites. And lastly, a significant percentage of eggs fail to hatch in the wild for a bunch of different reasons. But that's not the case for live bearing species. Likely due to both previously mentioned scenarios, the vast majority of live bearing young actually make it to their birthday. The more babies that survive, the better shape the species is in as a whole. So let's look at the two ways live bearing snakes do. We'll start with oviviparity. Eggs are made, but they're incubated inside. Garter snakes, like Roy here, are a good example of this. The initial process is pretty much identical to egg-laying species. Oocytes mature, grow, get fertilized, form eggs, the whole bit. But in this scenario, no calcified shell is created. Why would it be? There's no need to protect the egg from external dangers, so no armored shell needs to be made. The babies feed and develop off the yolk sac and grow big in their membranous egg bag, all cozy within their mom. <laughs> when they are fully developed, they break out of their egg and the mom pushes the babies out of the cloaca and off they go to take on the world. So noble of them. The other type of live birth is viviparity. True viviparity is pretty rare among snakes, but this is the approach that most boas, like boa constrictors, anacondas, and dural's boas, like this new mom to Sara here take. Uh, also, side note, if you are a patron or uh, an Instagram follower, you will have seen Tassara when she was fully gravid and know that she looks like a baby now herself because, um, well, she's a new mom. That's, that's exactly why. I think I'll actually put a before and after picture up just while I, after I edit this. Obviously not right now. I don't have the, like, you know what I mean. Um, because it is insane. Yeah, anyways. This scenario is a little more similar to how mammals gestate than egg-bearing reptiles, at least in the sense that there is an actual complex vascular network connecting the babies to the mom directly, and the mom nourishes the young throughout gestation as opposed to just dumping a bunch of stuff in an egg for the baby to grow from that stuff in the egg. As with the other two methods, the beginning is very similar to how the egg kicks off. Now, I know I said earlier I wasn't going to bore you and go into detail on how the egg actually develops, but I kind of need to, a little bit at least, to explain this next part. So, within an egg, there are two distinct parts that are each surrounded by a membrane. The abembryotic compartment that holds the yolk sac and the embryotic chamber that holds the growing embryo. Surrounding that embryotic chamber is the chorioantuus, which keeps bad stuff out and allows for nutrients and gases and waste to pass through it. In viviparous reptiles, that membrane acts as a placenta, connecting mother to offspring and allows the baby to draw the nutrients it needs from the mom, just like developing human babies do. When the babies are ready, they are often born still within their placental membrane and will need to push their way out of it to take their first breath of air. Why? One of the babies from her first clutch took its very first breath in my hands. Sometimes the babies will stay connected to the yolk sac via the umbilical cord and will continue to draw some nutrients from it until it falls off. How cool is that? Are you saying to yourself, hang on, yolk sac? Didn't you say viviparous snakes get nutrients from their mom? Why would there be a yolk sac? That's a good question. I'm glad you're paying attention too. Thank you. Yeah, even in viviparous snakes, there's still a yolk sac that the young does draw nutrients from too. And guess what? In ovoviviparous snakes, it seems that some of the nutrients are passed to the young from the mother via the coriantois. I don't know if I'm saying that last word correctly. It's here. Just read it and make your own assumptions. Thank you. I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong. Remember when I said that there was a bunch of conflicting information about who does what? Yeah, that's kind of why, in some cases at least. It's not strictly one way or the other. There are varying degrees of how much embryos rely on yolk versus mom, depending on the species. What is commonly referred to as viviparous snakes get most of the nutrients from their mom. Ovoviviparous get most of the nutrients from the yolk. But all live-bearing snakes can use a combination of both, even if it's just a tiny bit of one. 
that's why there are so many who are leaning towards the notion that we should be classifying reptiles as either oviparous or viviparous, with viviparity split between lesothotrophic viviparity for those that rely primarily on yolk, lesothotrophic meaning feeding on yolk, and matrotrophic viviparity for those relying on nutrients from the mother, matrotrophic meaning feeding on mother. Neat, eh? Okay. I think that concludes our lesson for today. If you're still watching, hit that like button. You earned it after learning all about that science stuff. Actually, you deserve to keep learning more about snake science-y stuff. So it's honestly best if you just subscribe too. A special thanks to all my wonderful patrons. Your support nourishes my channel and my scaly family. I can't thank you enough. You make all of this possible. If you would like to lend your support, head on over to patreon.com slash allcanadianreptilegirl. For as little as $2 a month, you can get extra videos, behind the scenes, updates on animals and projects, and what Tassara looks like when she was gravid way before anyone else, and early ad-free access to my videos. Thanks to you all for watching, and until next time, remember to nurture all nature. Bye. Because I kept going like this until I got to two methods. <laughs> this was a bit odd. Hi. Oh, yeah, there it is. There's the deer rules bow of behavior. Woo, don't fall, honey. <laughs> She's not used to being held because I haven't held her for like a couple months because she was gravid and I didn't want to hurt the baby. So she is a little, a little wonky with her balance right now, but that's okay, we'll work on it. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. I only have one hand. Stop it, stop it. He's very cute. Yeah. This is very cute. You should buy one. Hey, you look like someone who might want to know why snakes hold on to their poop so long. Well, you, you're in luck. Good for you. There's a video right here that explains why some snakes use their poop as an anchor. Yeah, you heard that right. Poop anchor. Don't believe me? Go check it out. You'll see. You'll understand.